Hi everyone. Hello. And um, welcome back. So this week's video is another history of perfume video, yeah. carrying on in our kind of series. So if you <laughs> we haven't, have, we haven't done for a while. No, we don't know when the last <laughs> time April, was. It was. Okay. Sorry. So we'll link below all the previous um, videos in the series of history yes. of fragrance. So you might want to catch up on them. Um, but today we're going to look at the kind of 1940 through to the end of the 70s. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So lots of things happen yeah, there's and quite a lots, big period. <laughs> lots of things where the fragrances are still available mm, now. Absolutely. So you might have heard of some yeah. of them. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because they're often there's a lot of social history and perfume history that are linked Always. so yeah. whatever was happening in fashion and in society mm. was um reflected yeah. in fragrance and so what would be interesting is if we maybe have a look at each decade yes and have a look at maybe what was the feel of each decade yeah. and some of the trends that were sparked off in perfume yes uh, Should we start with the 40s? Yeah, then? 40s was so, were coming up. Yes, more. there was not, I think we might have mentioned this in the previous mm. video, but like the end of the 30s, beginning of the 40s, there wasn't really much because everything mm. was shut down. There was, it was hard to ship ingredients mm. and that kind of thing. And anything that did come out hasn't really stood the test of no. time. So the beginning of the 40s were difficult, but then obviously the war ended and it was this celebration mm. of freedom mm. and. Um, the the vibe that must have been such a weird decade yes. because literally cut in half by exactly. 1945 and the vibe suddenly turned into like as you say a real kind of joyful thank God you know it's peace yeah. and fragrances were sort of ha uh, reflecting. reflecting on that yeah um, like Nina Rishi Lair du Temps mm. it's still a popular fragrance now you know the bottle has the two doves yeah it's twined. I think it was designed actually by her son mm. um, and just simply to resemble um, peace yeah. that, the, that the war was over um, and so yeah that's very um, well known mm. fragrance of the um, 40s mm. but as well as that kind of freedom and joy there was also a kind of sensuality that yes. came through in, in women's fragrances Definitely. suddenly like women had kind of right. found a new well been able to express a new yeah. side to them so because that a lot of them did all the work in the war exactly. you know the men were out fighting then the women were in the factories keeping the country running, I, yeah. I, you know, I think. So I suppose women must have felt like they needed to express themselves. Yes. And a great way to do that is through scent. Yes. Um, so we saw things that were um, a little bit more kind of leathery, sheep yeah. sensual, sexy kind of things. And um, particularly one that you might have heard of, uh, Femme de Rocha, yeah. which is, um, I don't know if it's still available. You might be able to clear this up. We feel it might not be in production it's at the moment. It's discontinued. Yeah, but is it? I don't know. Is it that's, coming back? I don't know if you've seen it. You might have Watch seen vintage space. ones. I don't know. Um, so but that was of its Sensuality, time. yes. Mm. But then in contrast to that, there was a trend for really fresh and green mm. fragrances. Mm. Things that often had um, galbanum yeah. in them. So galbanum is a resin, actually. It's a, a kind of really lovely, bright green mm. smell. It's um, like fresh cut grass. Like fresh it? cut grass but, but resinous. Yeah. Um, and that's in a lot of fragrances now today yes. actually. Like um, Mustard Cartier for example. Yes. Um, yeah. their, their gold one that they yeah. launched a couple of years ago has galvanum yeah. in it. Um, Miss Dior, Christian Dior, that famous and Cad Galvanum. Classic. Yes. And Lily of the Valley which and is Lily another of the Valley. one of the time. Those two together work quite well mm. and whenever I think of green fragrances and actually whenever I think of the 40s I think of Von Vair yeah. by Bauman. Um, which again is actually, I mean, Bauman is a brand that we have worked with up mm. until quite recently mm. and unfortunately they discontinued Von Vair. They such did bring it back yeah. and then they discontinued yeah. it. So uh, yeah, such a shame. Maybe it'll come back again in the future, but it's so green and mm. crisp, isn't it? Well, and the difficulty with very green fragrances like Von Vair is that they don't have a lot of staying power no. because those ingredients tend to be quite volatile and they evaporate quickly. Yeah. So. Um, the fragrances I think that have stood the test of time, like Miss Dior, mm. are the ones that have other sort More of balance. florals and yeah. chiffre type notes in them. Um, and talking of Dior, he, Christian Dior himself, his fashion at yes. that period was very luxurious, very exuberant, like metres of fabric. And I think that that also captured this sort of, you know, desirability mm. element, this element where people wanted to 
go back to having some luxury in their yeah. lives after yeah. having such hardship. Yeah. So um, he and other designers of the time were really mm. ex instrumental mm. in that. Yeah. Um, and then as you went on to the 50s, you had this kind of air of, um, well, consumerism. That's really, true. With that yes. whole kind of rock and roll era, the accessibility I mean, of, of everything. You know, you could buy a fridge for the yeah. first time. Really. America was yeah. very influential yeah. in the 50s in terms of influencing Europe. You know, Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, mm. all those kind of icons that everyone wanted to be like and that mm. kind of, yeah, rock and roll feel yeah. um, to things. And I think that came through in fragrance in that it, fragrance became much more accessible yeah it absolutely. wasn't just something that you had yeah. to go to a department store no. like a special trip special occasion no. um, drug stores were selling perfume yeah. suddenly and brands like Bourge, uh, bourgeois and max factor yeah suddenly made an appearance and well elizabeth not elizabeth arden um sa lauder yes was instrumental in bringing perfume to women who maybe could not have yeah, I mean, before. she was, I mean, you probably know the story, but, you know, Youth Dew is mm. their famous um, fragrance, and she bought it out originally as a bath oil because yeah. she felt like she wasn't sure whether women would be okay with buying something so luxurious as a mm. perfume for themselves. So she thought, well, if I sell a bath oil, it's a bit more of a practical product, they'll yeah. buy it. And so that did really well, and then she launched the fragrance afterwards, and it's still around today. Yeah. Isn't it interesting, because nowadays, like where I've grown up in perfumery, it's it's always been traditionally the woman that's uh -huh. coming in shopping for perfume but back in the, the sort of earlier half of the 20th century if you were a woman in say the 30s yeah. or 40s maybe you wouldn't have bought a fra fragrance for no. yourself it would only have been a present maybe yeah. from your husband because it was too luxurious you wouldn't have bought anything apart from the grocery yeah. would you, you know, that not. was the only thing you were permitted to spend his money on <laughs> exactly <laughs> on those days thank god um, so yeah the 50s was quite interesting for bringing perfume yes. to the forefront for co the common woman it was um, and then it, that trend just has carried on really yeah yeah, and in the 60s, um, I mean, the 60s for me is like a, it, it's a very iconic era in terms of perfume. I always think of patchouli. Yeah. You know, absolutely. I don't know whether it's just a British yeah. thing, like a London thing, Carnaby Street, no, Portobello Road. Well, I don't know. I mean, if we're Tell we are us British, if so. it is in other countries mm -hmm. as well. But the smell of the 60s was patchouli. Oh. And um, I actually went to a really interesting talk um, a few weeks back on patchouli that the Perfume Society did mm. in London. Um, I don't know if any of you are members of the Perfume Society. Um, if you live in the UK, it's really, it's really great. And it's not that expensive to join. They do some great events, and this was on patchouli, mm. and they had um, a perfumer talking about the production mm. of patchouli, but they also had um, actually Josephine Fairley, who runs the Perfume mm. Society, her husband, mm. um, who was quite kind of influential in the 60s, and he talked a lot, I mean, it was quite hilarious, actually, about how um, patchouli became so popular because it's a great thing to cover up the smell of other things. Ah. For example, things you might have been smoking yeah. that you shouldn't have been, which and were I very was a lot of that in the 60s, in I'm sure. In the 60s. Um, he was also the importer of the first Afghan coats oh, in right, the 60s. Okay. And the Afghan coats often got wet and smelly. So if you spray patchouli on you, then oh, that covered up funny. that smell as well. So, oh. I mean, because it is patchouli from a video on patchouli no, oh, no we really should, but it was often lots... used as like a moth repellent mm, and an mm. insect repellent because it's very pungent mm. smell so yeah that kind of hippie flower power and vibe. it smells dry you know yes. those sort of dry earthy kind of uh, sort of almost woody yeah. fragrances that you get a lot in the, of the 60s yeah and, and it was a base note in lots and lots of things yeah um i tell you talking about um also afghans <laughs> yeah um, Betty Vale was also quite popular yes. at the time. Yeah. And um, I remember we worked with a brand of the Paul Smith yeah. for quite a long time. And I remember Paul Smith mm -hmm. telling the story of him in his shops, because uh -huh. he was sort of, his first shops were around yeah. the 60s when he was a young fashion designer in London. And he had an Afghan hound oh, in his yes. shop. And this Afghan hound, I mean, they're massive and, and smelly. Yeah. And so he had been bought a bottle of Carvan's Vetiver oh. for Christmas or something. But he, at that time, didn't really wear fragrance. So he sprayed it on the dog. sprayed it on the dog. <laughs> <laughs> because he wanted to mask That's the That's very typical Afghan. Paul Smith, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's just occurred to me, and I remember yeah. it always. Oh, gosh. Um, 
Talking of men's fragrances though, this, this was, was a good period yes, for, for men having it's fragrances. It's weird because we've talked in our previous episodes about how fragrance was traditionally genderless. Mm. And then in the early 1900s, it became very much about women mm. and it was all marketed towards women, yeah, and beauty true. and all yeah. this kind of thing. And then in the 60s, I mean, again, um, Estee Lauder was quite influential mm. with this, with Aramis, mm. you know, she, I don't know whether it really was, but she coined it as being the first men's fragrance. Yeah. But there was also Already things had, like Brut. Yeah, Pat Fabergé's Brut yeah. was still around at, at the same time. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, I remember growing up in the sort of late 70s, 80s, my yeah. dad sort of spraying Brut, you know, yeah, so yeah, that yeah. endured for my quite some step, time. My stepdad still wears Aramis now, oh, and I think yeah. he's worn it since 1964, probably. <laughs> um, but yeah, classic men's fragrances mm. came around. And obviously in those days, they weren't so much a fragrance, but they were an aftershave. Yeah. So that's it's only in the last 10 years or so that men have got into the idea of an, a kind of perfume. Yes. If you're a man and you're watching, tell us, do, did you consciously switch sort of from thinking about aftershave splashing and it. splashing on to then an eau de toilette, mm. which you then perhaps spray on your torso? Because mm. um, still today, I talk to a lot of the girls who sell perfume in the stores, and they tell me that a lot of gentlemen customers come in and ask for aftershave, yeah. but they don't necessarily mean the skincare no, product. They no. mean an eau de toilette, yeah. so it's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, the other big men's fragrance of the time is Eau Sauvage, you know, the yes. Dior one. And that, um, reputedly, was the first fragrance to use something called Hedione. Oh, yes. Do you remember? So, yes, mm. Hedione's one of those, it's um, like an isolate, mm. isn't it? Mm. Um, so it's kind of fractioned from jasmine. Mm. Um, and it smells quite bright. Well, actually, it's so hard to describe. It doesn't really smell. It, what it does is it enhances, it enhances the smell of the fragrance yes. ingredients, and it gives citruses a lot of longevity and brightness. Yes. Yeah. So it's been very influential, and it's in a lot of fragrances. Mm. But it was started to be used widely um, in the sixties. Yeah. And then what about the 70s? Mm. I mean, my goodness. I mean, th so this is the year that, that we, well, I was born. Yes, no, thank you. Well, I was you. born in the 80s. Not quite you. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I don't remember much of it because I was very, very young. Yeah. Um, but I remember my mum's fashions, yeah. you know, from the 70s. Yeah. And it was the whole thing of, you know, you were either kind of a disco chick and yes. then, or you were like sort of big flared floral It was trousers, very like experimental you know, and kind of pearls. Yeah. sideburns for the men you know and, confident uh, wasn't it yeah, yeah and I think there was a lot of kind of expression of yourself in yes. the 70s so a lot of the fragrances were really quite powerful yeah that's true there was a lot of trend for this kind of Orientals. sexy oriental mm. animalic a bit um dangerous kind of fragrance and it's what summed that up perfectly is opium yeah a, you know a real big, classic big, of the time fragrance. you know remember it's a huge fragrance when they launched it um in new york it was 1977 mm. Um, and that kind of led the way, obviously we'll come on to the 80s in our next video, but that kind of led the way for what then kind of yeah. followed a lot in the 80s actually. It was definitely the start of this trend, I think, uh, that you found then in the 80s of the projection of fragrance. Yeah. You know, fragrance l laid a path for you. It yeah. kind of entered the room a few feet in yeah. front of you. Yeah. Um, but also, around the same time, it was this kind of emergence of the lifestyle scent. So Revlon cottoned on to this with mm. Charlie, um, Charlie was huge, and yeah. it was this whole kind of, again, very accessible scent. That's the thing, more Everyone affordable, younger girls. Mm. I mean, definitely when I was younger, you know, we'd buy like Charlie mm. or So, or, you know, all of those fragrances mm. that you could get like in the chemist mm. store, but still felt like a bit luxurious and yeah. special. The other trend, because often there is a sort of duality in the decades, yeah. was this trend towards romanticism. Mm. Um, and there was a lot of things like an A and A, Cacharel, for yes. example, um, very sort of romantic, quite floral, very sort of dreamy. Yeah. Um, and one that's actually the one of the fragrances that Sarah and I mm. work with, Oscar. Yeah. The Oscar de Laurenti fragrance, which was made in 1977, mm. really captured that sort of romanticism trend. Um, I mean, this whole thing was. Express. Yeah. This was Oscar de Laurenti himself, who grew up in. I think the Dominican Republic. Yes. Talking about you know when he was a child, he used to go out and imagine capturing the dewdrops off of mm. all the flowers and making a scent out of them. And then when he came to make this scent, this was kind of the story of this sort of romantic yeah. idea. So of floral, um, all the florals together, and mm. yeah, it does smell like 
the 70s mm. for me it's got that kind of, sort of nostalgic way yeah you know that nostalgic classic mm. feel to mm. it that wouldn't be like a a, a bouquet of flower fragrance today no you know exactly there is because I think something that captured that time was that aldehydic mm, note that's and true. you've got those aldehydes that sparkle that appears yes. in there alongside this sort of lovely um, wealth of jasmine yeah. and, and rose etc but then also on a woody base yeah so you've got this kind of lovely sort of anchor to the fragrance mm. to give it there's a lot of depth in yes, here yes there is yeah mm. yeah so no, the bottle is very similar. Yeah, the bottle yeah, is this very, reminds me. I don't think it's really changed much. I don't it think might have it been has. slightly um, adjusted over the years, but yeah, it's it is very much seventies. Um, right, so that brings us up to end of the seventies. Yeah. We'll do another one shortly um, for the eighties, probably through to the current. Yeah, day. I mean, again, the lots of change in the in the last sort of forty years. Yeah, um, but it's quite interesting when you start to come on to more recent mm. um, times and see, you know, what has stood the test yeah. of time and what hasn't. Yeah, because you get like I don't know nowadays they're like fifteen hundred fragrances launched every year. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. ridiculous. Yeah, um, there you go. So we'll see you all next time, and yeah, hope you enjoyed. Bye. Bye.